Good evening and <clears throat> welcome to all to our April 10th, 2020 Good Friday service at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Strasburg, Illinois. May the Lord be with you and keep you in these times as we are here to listen uh, and be reminded of our Lord's bitter suffering and death for us on the cross of Calvary. If you happen to have a, a Lutheran hymn book, a TLH, and our LSB, Lutheran Service Book, handy, you might uh, want to just have that nearby. We'll make a reference in our worship service uh, to some hymns in both of these hymn books. Uh, we make our beginning now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you happen to have the Lutheran hymn book, turn to hymn 169. Uh, I would just like to share and read with you the five verses of hymn 169 in TLH. Uh, some of these verses deal with our message this evening as we uh, hear of the death of our Lord and, and the things in nature that happened with the earthquake and uh, uh, the temple veil being torn in two. Jesus Christ, our Lord most holy, Lamb of God so pure and lowly, blameless, blameless on the cross art offered, sinless, sinless, for our sins has suffered. Weep now, all ye wretched creatures, as ye view his gracious features. Jesus, Jesus on the cross is dying. Nature, nature in dark gloom is sighing. Christ, his last word having spoken, bows his head as life is broken. Mournful, mournful stands his mother weeping. Loved ones, loved ones, Silent watch our keeping. The great veil was torn asunder. Earth did quake mid roars of thunder. Boulders, boulders into bits were breaking. Sainted, sainted dead from death were waking. As his side with spear was riven, blood and water forth were given. Jesus, Jesus, Sinners only Savior, mercy, mercy, grant to us forever. Amen. We will make confession of our sins. Uh, if you have your Lutheran service book, you would find this on page 184, page 184 on the bottom left. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this year confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce unto you the grace uh, and, uh, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the stead and command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading for this Good Friday is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 45, where we read of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we will uh, look in our sermon message at uh, the words of some of the enemies of Jesus as they spoke during his passion. Here, the words of the Roman centurion by the cross. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. 
About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud spirit, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and, mother, uh, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. This is the reading of our scripture lesson. God's grace, mercy, and peace be and abide with you all. Our text is from our scripture, Matthew 27, verse 54, which reads again, Now when the captain and those watching with him saw the earthquake and the other things happening, they were terrified, saying, Certainly this was the Son of God. Dear friends of Christ. Jesus, our Lord. The Old Testament prophet, Zechariah, lived and worked 500 years before Jesus Christ was born. And he sometimes has been called the prophet of Holy Week. One of the prophecies about Jesus in Zechariah is this. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus, you will remember, reminded his disciples of this prophecy on Monday, Thursday evening. In the Bible it says, Jesus told his disciples, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Peter and the other Apostles protested that, that this must not happen. But later on, that night, Jesus was arrested. And the Bible tells us that all the disciples of our Lord deserted him and fled. In addition to all the physical pain and mental agony and spiritual pain that our Lord endured, he also had to endure the desertion of his closest friends. By Friday afternoon, who was left? Peter had denied him. Judas had betrayed him. Where were all his followers? When he was crucified on the cross, only John was there and some women who followed to watch him 
now die. The most amazing expression of faith came from none of these, but from somebody we would call the enemy of Christ, from a Roman centurion, a Roman captain. Because he was a Roman centurion, a captain uh, taking care of a hundred men, he is classified as one of Jesus' enemies. Yet what he says makes him much more like one of Jesus' friends. Again, our text, and he said, certainly this was the Son of God. This Good Friday evening, we want to ask, what was it that led this Roman army captain and others with him to make such a confession of faith? We will see three things. One, we're going to see that he was terrified when he saw what, what nature was doing. And secondly, uh, he was puzzled when he heard what the onlookers were saying about Jesus. And then thirdly, he was convinced when he saw how Jesus died. Let's look at these three closer. What led this Roman centurion to make such a confession of faith that he said, certainly, this was the Son of God. First of all, he was terrified when he witnessed and saw what was happening in nature around him. Matthew tells us in his Gospel, the earth shook and the rocks split. Now, earthquakes sometimes happen in many parts of the world. It, it happened here at this time, but... But this earthquake was not any kind of coincidence. It was a direct act of God that took place exactly at the time when God determined it should. Other things that happened that first Good Friday could never be dismissed as mere coincidence. How could we explain the, the darkness that started at 12 noon and covered the earth until 3 o'clock in the afternoon when our Lord died? As Luke puts it, he said, the sun stopped shining. Phelan, who is a Greek author, who lived about 100 years after Jesus, reported, and he writes, we have his record, he says about this day and this time, quote, it became night in the sixth hour of the day so that the stars even appeared in the heaven. Now, a reasonable theory, somebody, if they want to give some kind of an explanation to this, could say, well, an eclipse happened and occurred. But that wouldn't work because Jesus died, we clearly know, at the time of the Passover. Jews celebrated the Passover at the full moon. A solar eclipse can't take place at the time of a full moon. God made it dark. And then there were other signs of nature. We can't be sure that the Roman centurion saw all of them, but Matthew clearly, in God's word, tells us that at that moment, that at the moment Jesus died, he said, I quote, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Maybe that earthquake could do some damage to the temple. Maybe the, something could happen to the curtain. But here, in, in that massive temple between the holy place and the holy of holies, a thick curtain torn neatly in two. Uh, that's what Scripture records. Coincidence? Never. Never could that happen by coincidence. Now God was clearly giving a message. Jesus had died in the Old Testament. The priests made sacrifice and intercession for the people. Now that Jesus once and for all sacrificed His blood, no other sacrifices were necessary. No longer were the priests daily to go into the holy place or once a year on the Day of Atonement to the Holy of Holies to make sacrifice. The temple curtain is torn. Man 
man has direct access to God by the death and the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Matthew also tells us the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And our text again tells us, listen, now when the captain and those watching Jesus with him saw the earthquake and the other things happening, they were terrified. When nature does what it did that day, what else can men be but scared? This army captain, the centurion, said, certainly this was the Son of God. He said that because of what he witnessed had happened in nature. And now secondly, we're going to see, because he was puzzled by by what the onlookers said about Jesus. The army centurion could only guess what, at first, what all these things meant. But he could hear the unusual words of the onlookers as they shouted at, at this man who was on the middle cross. The words he heard from these onlookers must have really puzzled him. He had never heard these words or anything like them ever addressed to anybody dying on a cross. Come down from the cross, they said. If you are the Son of God, let God now rescue him if he wants. He said, I am the Son of God. These were Jews. They worship one God. They would hardly expect their one God to be dying on a cross as a criminal. And they were shouting, He said, I am the Son of God. All of this must have made this centurion think. And then there was also the matter of of people saying that, that he was a king. He was the king of Israel, the onlookers shouted. Clearly, though they were mocking uh, the words, but Pilate had put them over the, the head of Jesus. This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. But it also spoke of the charges that they had brought against him. He claims to be Christ the King. This same centurion, it's interesting, Jesus had been preaching and teaching in and out of Jerusalem for three years. Who knows if he had happened to hear him around the temple court or in the marketplace or heard what others had said of this Jesus of Nazareth. And this same Roman centurion very likely was around Jesus as as he was appearing before Herod and in the court and the trial uh, before Pilate. And if so, he would have heard Pilate struggling to try to figure out Jesus and his kinship and why the people were bringing him to him. Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? And when Jesus then answered, my kingdom is not of this world, probably uh, Pilate said that, well, you are a king. We know he, he said something like that. But then he was left in the dark once more because Jesus was speaking of his kingship as a reign of peace. If Jesus, the centurion, must have been wondering, if he was a king, what kind of a king was he? He didn't look like a king. Uh, over whom did he rule? This, this Roman captain, I'm sure, was puzzled by all these things that were going on. And probably most puzzling to this Roman centurion was he was familiar with the justice system of Rome. Rome did try to give just and fair trials to the people it ruled. He must have wondered, well, why had had Jesus ever even gone to trial again? He probably had heard of him and knew of him as a man of peace. Why had he ended up on a cross? 
In fact, if he was around while Pilate was was dealing with the Jews and trying to judge Jesus, um, he would have heard Pilate say, I find no basis for a charge against him. In fact, three times Pilate had to say and admit, this man is innocent. I find no guilt in him. And, And then why were these onlookers, these Jewish leaders, the common people love Jesus, but the Jewish Jewish leaders and rulers gathered here. Why were they so hateful? Why did they want to see him die? The ministry of Jesus had caused a great stir all throughout Judea and Galilee, all through Jerusalem and the area around Everybody was saying and speaking about him that this was a prophet, Jesus, a prophet in word and deed before God and all the people. No one ever spoke like him before. The common people loved him. His miracles helped so many people. He was one who preached not like the scribes and the uh, Sadducees or the Pharisees, but as one having authority. As the Apostle Paul even told Festus, these things were not done in a corner. People in Jerusalem heard and they knew, and they knew about Jesus Christ. Everything that this centurion possibly may have known about Jesus made him think, that he must be a righteous man. Anyone who knew him or anybody who heard the court proceedings would be puzzled why he's here now on the cross. The Roman centurion had said, certainly this was the Son of God. He made this Confession now, thirdly, because he was convinced of it when he saw how Jesus died, that indeed Jesus was God. This Roman captain, being a captain, he had been around for quite a while, and he had seen, I'm sure, countless other men suffer and die on the cross. He had had seen them exposed to to the abuse of those around him. He had, in the crucifixions before, he had seen the flies. He had smelled the stench. He had seen sometimes how, how these people, these horrible criminals who were dying, just hung on to life, a living death for even days upon the cross. And he had heard all the crucified men on the cross, suffering and dying. He had heard them curse their enemies, curse the Roman soldiers, spit and shout profanities at them, pray to their their false gods and and say that that their gods are going to get even with them for what they are doing. But this Roman centurion saw none of this take place in Jesus Jesus, he saw, did not vow to get even. In fact, Jesus lovingly and kindly prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He didn't react with anger when the one criminal on the cross made fun of him and teased him also. In fact, then there was the other criminal who said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus lovingly said, Today you will be with me in paradise. And then he cared for his mother. And he was assured that that here was one who was going to take care of his mother after he was gone. He never a single time ever complained from the cross. This centurion had never, had never ever seen anyone die the way Jesus died. 
For other men, crucifixion. This was the final defeat after spending a, a, a lifetime as, as being losers. And other men on the cross, he had, he had witnessed them and he had seen them time after time die after long periods of agony. Often they died uh, when they were unconscious. But, but Jesus cried out in a loud voice just before he died. The, hap, the captain heard Jesus cry out. Jesus said, It is finished! What other criminal, what other criminal ever died like that? He, he saw uh, the triumph in Jesus' voice. He saw what Jesus said was a, a victor shout. And then he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It sounded like someone who had been on a, a noble unique mission and his mission now was done this cry had the ring of a man of peace he had finished his job he was going back home from where he came and after the shouts the Roman centurion after Jesus said it is finished it is finished he simply then bowed his head and he died no one no one took his life from him he gave it up on his own. What kind of a person ever dies like that? The captain was convinced when he saw how Jesus died. Certainly, certainly, this was the Son of God. Luke's Gospel, immediately after the story, of the Roman captain tells us when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place they they beat their breasts and they went away everyone who saw these things got much more than what they bargained for unnatural darkness an earthquake an unusual death. It shook the people who watched it to the very core. They were seized with a feeling that what they had seen, that what had been done that day, was all wrong. Had ever a man lived like this? Had ever a man died like this? Had God, had God ever before marked the death of any other man with these kinds of signs? Was the Jewish Sanhedrin dead wrong about this man? Did they make a horrible mistake? Have the others become an accomplice in the, the shedding of innocent blood? Another Good Friday will soon be past. This evening we probably have millions of Americans sheltered in place listening to their church's sermon broadcast on Good Friday and, and that is just great. But we as we have heard again of the death of of our Lord. We cannot come away from the cross unshaken. We are never the same on Good Friday after we have heard the gospel. We are sinners. Christ Jesus hung on that cross because of us and our sins and the sins of the world. Yet God has loved us and sent Jesus on that noble mission to suffer and die and shed His blood. And by His grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. He went through what we deserve. We are forgiven. We are God's children now and forever. We are never the same on Good Friday. Either the cross of Jesus Christ 
either the cross of Jesus Christ and hearing again His suffering and death, either it draws us ever closer to Jesus Christ our Savior or it pushes us further away. The Bible says that to too many the cross is a stumbling block to them. St. Paul also explained this in somewhat the same way when he said, uh, the fragrance of life, the cross, he says, the gospel, is the fragrance of life to some and the stench of death to others. To us, it is that fragrance of life. The little cross gives us everlasting life, makes us God's children, gives us hope in these days of all the things that is happening around us. And sad to say, it's the stench of death. To others. May we make the Roman captain, the centurion's confession of faith, our very own. May we too, again, this Good Friday, stop and consider what God caused to happen in nature that terrible Good Friday. May we stop and consider what the onlookers beneath the cross said about Jesus and how he died. Let us remember why he died. It was for your sins. It was for my sins. And believing in him, we have forgiveness and life everlasting. Let us remember why he died for us. And let us all every day say, Certainly, this was the Son of God. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we heartily thank you for all that you did for us on that first Good Friday, that you endured it for our sins, as our substitute, you were given unjust trust, trials before Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, Pilate and Herod. In our place, you were beaten by the soldiers, crowned with thorns, put into garments of mockery, spit upon, rejected, and despised. For your clothes they gambled. For us, you did bear the cross to Calvary and were crucified between two criminals. But when we behold you outstretched on the cross, your sacred hands and feet pierced with cruel nails, then we realize to the full extent what a terrible thing sin is. Keep us and our lives from crucifying you again and again by unholy living. Help us, we who have been saved by you, to live our lives for you. Help us to look with compassion upon others, even as you did look with compassion on us, and move us to do all within our power to bring your saving gospel to others. For you are indeed is exactly as the centurion said, certainly, truly, this is the Son of God. O Heavenly Father, when our earthly days are over, take us to your heavenly home where we will live with you forevermore. And Heavenly Father, continue to be with our people at St. Paul's and your people scattered everywhere, that if it is your will, we remain safe in these times and we pray for our country and world that as soon as possible it may recover and that all people will look to you and give thanks and praise and glory. May all the world confess you as the Son of God, the Savior, who suffered and died and gave your life as the ransom, as the payment of many. And we also pray together the words that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will, not, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you have near the Lutheran service book, your hymnal, you might want to turn to page 451. If not, just please listen as we close our Good Friday service as I share with you the words of these four verses. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis the Christ by man rejected. Yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long-expected prophet, David's son, yet David's Lord. Proofs I see sufficient of it. Tis the true and faithful word. Tell me, ye who think, who hear him groaning, was there ever grief like his? Friends, through fear his cause disowning, foes insulting his distress. Many hands were raised to wound him, none would intervene to save, but the deepest stroke that pierced him was a stroke that justice gave. Ye who think of sin but lightly, now suppose the evil great. Here may view its nature rightly, here its guilt may estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed, see who bears the awful load. Tis the Word, the Lord's anointed, Son of Man and Son of God. Here we have a firm foundation, here the refuge of the lost, Christ the rock of our salvation is the name of which we boast. Lamb of God for sinners wounded, sacrifice to cancel guilt, none shall ever be confounded who on him their hope has built. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.